Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our program that we call Menninger Mindscape. I'm Dr. John Oldham, the Chief of Staff at Menninger Clinic, uh, and it's wonderful to have as our guest today Dr. Peter Fonagy. Um, I had a chance to interview Peter in another program that you may have seen where we had some very interesting discussions about some healthcare initiatives uh, in England. Today we're going to talk about some of the very fundamental and important contributions that Peter has made in the field of mental health and some of his help and consulting and advice to us at the Menninger Clinic and at Baylor. Um, in case you didn't see the other program, let me just mention that Peter is the Freud Memorial Professor of Psychoanalysis and head of the Research Department of Clinical, Educational, and Health Psychology at the University College London, or UCL. He has lots of other things, including um, a consultant to our child and family program here at Menninger, and has been consultant actually for many years. How many years, Peter? Oh, I don't know. It's getting closer to 20. That closer to 20. Yeah. So he was very, very active in helping Menninger when it was located at Topeka and has continued with us, and we're delighted that he has. Um, Peter is a pioneer in lots of areas. One particular area closely associated with Peter is uh, mentalization-based therapy and an approach to working with patients um, under the heading of mentalization, which he's developed with his colleague Anthony Bateman. Um, before I ask you, Peter, to tell us a little bit about that, I do want to mention one other thing, which is Peter gets lots of honors, uh, but recently has had a really remarkable one conferred, which is uh, that he's been recipient of the Order of the British Empire, or OBE, which was conferred by the Queen, uh, and congratulations. Thank you very much. So one of the things particularly of interest uh, in connection with mentalization is the attachment process. And Peter's been very interested in child development and adolescent development. So talk to us a little, Peter, about how you got uh, focused in the developmental process on what you refer to as mentalization, how you would describe that, and then we'll focus a little bit on our adolescent treatment program here. Mm -hmm. I mean, mentalization is a form of social cognition that involves uh, understanding other people's behavior in terms of mental states and one's own behavior in terms of mental states. That capacity develops in the context of attachment relationships for most of us in early childhood. It's not particularly genetically uh, linked. It's something that links to the quality of the environment that you're in. The more mindful, the more thoughtful, the more that the environment focuses on uh, internal states, thoughts, feelings, wishes, beliefs, and desires, the more sensitive uh, you are to those states in yourself and in other people. Um, Let me interrupt to ask one question, because you referred to it as not particularly genetic, and I don't think that is the emphasis or the, the primary um, understanding. But temperament and genetic differences may play a role. Would that be correct? They may certainly play a role, uh, but uh, they are further up the causal pathway, so that it's the quality of the relationship uh, that actually determines the quality of mentalizing. Uh, rather than uh, what you genetically bring to it. Because what you genetically bring to it may, uh, your parents bring to it, or your, as a child bring to it, you may be a difficult person who's very difficult to understand, and your parents struggle to understand you, which will undermine your capacity to develop mentalizing. But some kids with uh, genetic predisposition to all kinds of uh, abnormalities, psychological abnormalities, actually uh, become resilient to that partly because uh, the capacity of the parents to look after them uh, in a thoughtful and uh, mindful way. So it's an interactive process and a developmental one. It's an interactive and developmental one, which is, uh, emerges, it's one of the most fundamental of human capacities. And uh, it emerges gradually over the first years of life and actually doesn't end in development now, we know, until 25. It goes through uh, a bit of a choppy period in adolescence. And we've all noticed that uh, our adolescent kids have difficulties in uh, understanding us and uh, perhaps understanding themselves fully. So we, we, uh, We've shared notes about that yes, in terms exactly. of both it of our, is, <laughs> our kids. Uh, once, once you've got, uh, uh, got, been through adolescence yourself and then go through a few times with your kids, you know. However, um, uh, because of that, uh, I think it's incredibly important for us to help adolescents through this difficult time. And they're trying to 
think about mental states in a slightly more complicated way because of the maturation of the prefrontal cortex in that period. Uh, they, it's, it's a qualitative leap forward in terms of their understanding uh, of mental states, which sometimes gets them into trouble. Um, and uh, as a consequence, very often we find that mental disorders start in adolescence that are, are, are linked to this. Self-harm being a, a, a very important one of these. In England, uh, currently, self-harm is uh, so common uh, that uh, in my childhood, 10, 11% would have been unthinkable as the prevalence rate for self-harm. Now, in most uh, schools, that is, in fact, uh, what we find. Well, we see it over here, too, very much. In fact, a new proposed diagnosis that's being considered in the diagnostic manual is non-suicidal self-injury, which yeah. is sort of a phrase that addresses that. How do you understand that explosion of that type of behavior? Well, um, obviously, uh, the, the, the social context uh, plays an enormous part, but actually, uh, the social context, the individual becomes vulnerable to that social context because of their uh, less, uh, uh, no, their, their difficulties in conceiving of their own feelings and those of others in mental state terms. The entire mentalizing uh, concept actually arose out of studying uh, in uh, adolescents with diabetes who managed their diabetes very poorly. Uh, insulin dependent diabetes very poorly because their thoughts and feelings found their way into the way they managed their diabetes. All that we needed to do to set them right was help them understand uh, their actions more in terms of mental states and the actions of others more in terms yeah, of mental that's, states. And that's, it was helpful. that's very interesting. In fact, we've had some examples of some of uh, uh, the adolescents who are in our adolescent treatment program here in our young adult program where that management of early onset diabetes has been a critical and life scary, threatening problem. So bring us here in terms of what we're doing on the adolescent treatment program and how this framework um, you see as a very valuable way to help these, these uh, young, young people. The Menninger Adolescent uh, uh, Treatment Program is probably, in my view, the best program currently there is nationally, and in fact probably internationally, in being focused on this specific capacity that adolescents uh, need to develop in order to manage the new social relationships that they're desperate to get engaged with biologically. Uh, but because uh, they come uh, to these relationship with perhaps some vulnerabilities in terms of mentalizing, they get into all kinds of turmoil in start trying to understand others and trying to understand themselves in relation to others, helping them with these interpersonal uh, problems, helping them mentalize better in a focused way, sets them on the right track. And once they're set on that right track, it actually, the rest of their social life, the rest of the world around them usually takes care of itself. Uh, so what the ATP does in a brilliant way is to um, help adolescents um, in this crisis, in a crisis of self-understanding, a crisis of understanding others, put them uh, on a good track and actually uh, uh, find in general that they then, development takes its course um, once they are, they are over this little hurdle. Well, one of the advantages, I think, of the kind of treatment that the ATP program can provide is an interprofessional intensity of treatment that involves many different experts um, with different kinds of skills, but it also involves time. So this kind of lasting, we hope, change isn't possible to do in a few days, I, I don't think. Would you agree? It, it, it is a, a capacity that takes you know, 25 years to develop. Uh, when it's retarded or, or, or in, uh, an individual runs into difficulty in relation to that, they need, a, they need assistance. They need a little bit of physiotherapy, if you like, to get back uh, on track. It takes a few months, um, but you can do it, and you can do it with incredible efficiency if you focus on it. What the ATP does is to take the uh, young person's behavioral problems look at it in the context of their mentalizing and interpersonal difficulties, said that in a, in a community that focuses on enhancing everyone's uh, mentalizing abilities, 
including uh, helping the families understand their kid better and the kid to understand the family better. And this focus, I think, is uh, so much more effective and so much more, as you say, uh, something that sets the kid up for a, a more positive development and a more positive developmental path than a, 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 a fixing of a particular, just a particular behavioral problem. Because ultimately, it is the relationships that the kid engages in that will sustain them uh, on a healthy path of development. Well, right, and one of the things that we're doing with the leadership of Liz Newland and Carla Sharp is we're hoping to learn about how these, these adolescents do after they leave. Uh, we have outcome studies where we're studying how they're doing while they're here, but then following them after they leave for at least a year if we can, uh, to see if we can demonstrate that this kind of approach really does make a difference, and, and I hope that's what we see. Uh, and from the data that I've seen so far, I think you can uh, make a, a quite a, an important claim that the treatment that occurs here is more effective than treatments that I've seen in a number of other centers that use a more restrictive approach. Because what you guys do is to combine uh, the behavioral and cognitive treatments that occurred elsewhere in this framework, in this mentalizing relational framework that see these kids uh, uh, in, a, in a good way for a long time to come. Well, I wish we had more time, Peter, to talk about this in more depth. We are always limited on these programs, but Thank you so much for telling us a little bit about um, the nature of this program, how the concept of this treatment framework developed, but also for your steady and continuous consultation and help to us at the Menninger Clinic and in the department at Baylor. We're very appreciative of that, and your input is tremendously valuable, so we appreciate your telling us about it. It's an honor for me. Good. So thank you for joining us, and we'll look forward to seeing you again next time.